Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live extreme weather briefing as we have a supercell set up this afternoon to discuss across northeastern Oklahoma. Here you can see the satellite imagery that shows uh, that cold upper level vort and especially the dry air that's coming in at the mid levels here. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, elevated. Uh, precipitation that's moving off to the northeast, some low-level clouds as well. But with this dry air that's coming in over top of that, that's going to create quite a bit of surface heating, strong low-level lapse rates, and then there's a bowling ball of an upper-level storm system that's going to be migrating across the uh, Kansas-Oklahoma border there. And really right along that uh, vort max and just ahead of it is where there is a conditional potential uh, for supercell storms. I've seen a lot of people call this a cold core setup. Uh, but really it is not uh, your traditional cold core. You need more of a symmetric upper level closed, upper level low. Uh, then you can get that occluded west to east boundary with those uh, surface winds backing a little bit. You get those due easterly winds just on the stable side of that boundary. A lot of heating on the south side. But this uh, event does have some cold core characteristics. Uh, and we're going to be breaking that down uh, here during this live extreme weather briefing. First of all, I want to show you what it looks like in the upper levels, and this is why I don't consider this a traditional cold core, as there is going to be a little arc of surface base instability out ahead of this Vort Max, and it's not your symmetric uh, closed upper level low uh, that you usually often get with traditional cold cores. A lot of the flow is located on the south side of this, not even close to symmetric in terms of its flow. Uh, in fact, a complete lack of flow on the north side, almost an upper wave, but it does have that cold blob of air uh, that can happen uh, uh, that does make uh, uh, these cold core events happen. You get an upper level cold vort max like this, basically a bowling ball aloft that spreads over top those modest dew points. That dry air comes in at the mid levels, creating an elevated mix layer. And that's how you get uh, these tornadic storms. This is the NAM model here, uh, but there are definitely some holes that are associated uh, with this system as well. Uh, some things that are not as favorable. There you can see that 998 surface low. And really just ahead of that surface low is where we want to watch uh, for convective initiation later on this afternoon. It looks like at about 19 to 20 Z is going to be that hot spot as that surface low is moving off to the east of the Wichita area. I think southeastern Kansas down into far northeastern Oklahoma like Bartlesville up to Parsons looks to be a good target. But there are definitely some negative factors with this setup too. Uh, because it's not that... Uh, vertically stacked, uh, upper level closed, upper level low. Uh, the system, uh, the surface features and the upper level system is moving quite rapidly. So there's a very, very small window for those cold core supercells, uh, low top supercells, as opposed to a traditional cold core setup where that occluded boundary sets up directly underneath that closed upper level low and you get convection that develops on the unstable side, relatively dry, well-mixed side, and then they cross over that east-west boundary. In this case, though, you've got a surface low that's ejecting pretty fast, but there is a narrow window between uh, around 19 and 20 Z there in southeastern Kansas. But there you can see the progression uh, of that uh, surface low along the uh, Kansas-Oklahoma border. Let's also see what the wrap shows in terms of surface base instability. You can already see that instability axis developing here. And normally you would get a west to east oriented occluded boundary here that's fairly close to the surface low, but actually behind uh, the parent surface low and directly underneath uh, that vertically stacked upper system. That's when you get those cold cork, that cold core convection that will ride north of that west to east oriented boundary. But this is more of a hybrid setup. You do have an arc of surface base instability lifting off to the northeast. The thing that concerns me with this setup is that because it's a relatively open wave and an asymmetric upper system, that uh, surface low is going to project to the east pretty rapidly. And it's possible that it could push uh, that surface base instability directly into the low-level stable air uh, that has happened this morning. Uh, but look at that. It does eject that blob of surface base instability all the way up into the uh, Kansas-Oklahoma uh, border. That's even by 21Z. So between 19Z and 21Z, there you can see that's uh, when you're going to get that tornado potential happening. Look at that dry line surge to the east as well, to the east of I-35 by 21Z by 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. So between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, there is a window for a tornadic supercell or two to develop along the Kansas-Oklahoma border. And there are some veered surface winds as well. Uh, but above that, there's quite a bit of speed shear that is leading to some pretty decent wind shear, especially in the low levels where a lot of that cape is going to be concentrated. 
But the core of the greatest instability definitely is off to the east, closer to that stable air uh, near the intersection of the Kansas-Oklahoma-Missouri border. And I think that those supercells might be a little bit west of that. You can see that little lobe of instability that extends off to the west there. But directly underneath that upper level system, and again, I apologize if there is any background noise there. Uh, my sister is over here and her uh, son, uh, who's five years old, is here uh, playing right now. And uh, as soon as I'm done with my talk at ChaserCon, uh, coming up here at about 2 p.m., I'm going to join them, of course. We're going to get the bird in the air, fly that around. Always a good time. But this bowling ball of an upper system there, that's what we're watching. And notice between 18 and 21Z that it's actually moving quite fast. And uh, one thing I've noticed with those cold core setups that really crank is that the upper level system is actually pretty stagnant and kind of hangs back, hangs back over that occluded boundary, that west east oriented boundary. But with this bowling ball ejecting like that, who knows what's going to happen? I think we're going to have some kind of a hybrid supercell setup happening, an arc of low top supercells that develops uh, beneath this cold upper level Vort Max. Look at how compact it is on the HRRR, more compact than other models have been showing. And what really matters for uh, these cold core setups is the low level cape. So you're not necessarily looking at the whole cape throughout the column. Uh, the, the, uh, the zone where these supercells form uh, relatively low in the mid and low parts of the troposphere. Uh, but still, it's a supercell setup. You don't want to get too bogged down in uh, calling this a cold core setup. Uh, there's probably going to be low top supercells here to the east of Wichita and all along this west to east boundary. One thing I'm noticing, though, is that the instability comes in kind of on the back side of this convection, whereas the inflow region here to the east is relatively stable. So that's definitely going to be interesting. But the inflow coming into these supercells is really out of the southwest at the surface, as we're going to see here. But there's that arc of supercells that's going to evolve near Wichita to the east of Wichita, down into northeastern Oklahoma, where they may be banked up against the stable air just a little too much. But I think that this band of convection here, southeastern Kansas into northeastern Oklahoma, is going to be interesting as it plays out. And then by 19Z, they start to cluster together already near the Wichita area as the upper level system ejects to the east. So what you're going to have to do as a chaser is start out early, way off to the west near Wichita, and then catch each of the new storms as they develop down this arc. Uh, they'll have a tendency to cluster together a little bit and then move to the stable side of that west-east oriented boundary. Then you'll have to jump down to another cell a little further southeast of that, jump down to another cell like that. I would love to be chasing this convection. Beautiful convection with a really, really nice crisp updraft basis. That's what these storms are going to look like. You're going to see that beautiful bubbling convection taking full advantage of that low-level cape. And then by this time, already by 20Z, uh, that convective line is starting to move in uh, to southwestern Missouri, uh, just crossing the Missouri-Kansas border there near the Pittsburgh-Kansas area and kind of clustering together on the backside to the north of that west-east oriented boundary. And it's possible you could get some new surface-based convection as well that develops down into the Missouri side. But by this time, it's possible the event will already be done and will have already happened. So I think you've got a very narrow window starting at about 19Z just to the east of Wichita in southeastern Kansas. You're going to have to work these cells on the southeastern side as a new cell develops. I would be chasing this, but I do have to do, uh, I committed uh, to speaking at ChaserCon later today about our rocket launch coming up here. But I do want to do a live weather briefing on this setup and then another briefing after my ChaserCon talk. Uh, the ChaserCon talk is more of a practice for our rocket paper, which we're going to be publishing here shortly. But here you can see the moisture axis. You have mid-50s dew points all the way into southeastern Kansas. And just ahead of that surface low. By 19Z, though, this is already starting to eject that surface low. And that's going to be a potential mitigating factor for this severe weather. Is just kind of how quickly uh, the features evolve. How quickly the surface low lifts off to the northeast. Let's look at a forecast sounding here at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time just ahead of this. And you can see a lot of stable air just ahead of that convective line in southeastern Kansas despite relatively favorable hodographs out there directly underneath the uh, surface low. 
Kind of some weird looking soundings directly underneath that convection. So that surface low may eject too rapidly off to the northeast and kind of move in to that stable air. And you may not get the perfect co-location of that low level cape and uh, the best surface vorticity. This is the three kilometer cape axis here. Shows up really well in the HRRR almost all the way up to the surface low. But by this time, by 20Z, the surface low as analyzed by the HRRR is a little bit northeast of there. Northeast of that arc. So there's the arc. There's the surface low. Well, it looks pretty close. So really you want to target the nose of that three kilometer cape axis right up here into southeastern Kansas by 20Z. Parsons, Coffeyville area. A lot of low-level cape, and interestingly, not a lot of mid-level flow either directly underneath that surface low. But this is the low-level cape that everybody's talking about, and a lot of times, especially as you get more toward traditional cold core season, these things can light up. Look at that cape really max out here in the southeastern corner of Kansas, northeastern Oklahoma. But you look at the soundings, and they do have a decent shear vector with that uh East northeasterly storm motion about 25 knots. Surface wind basically calm. Uh, it is a little bit uh, weak out of the due south at about 10 knots. Just above that, the one kilometer wind in excess of 40 knots out of a southwest there. Borderline supercell environment, uh, but you've got your mid and upper level flow at about 25 to 30 knots, which so should be still enough to evacuate the rain and the hail from the updraft. But the inflow will be coming in in general from the southwest into these. That's unusual. So this convective line will be developing kind of within this cape axis right here to the northeast of it. You're going to have some stable air. Inflow will be coming in from the west-southwest. Then you have this dry line feature surging off to the east. So they'll develop along that dry line, which should be interesting. Pseudo dry line, I guess you could call it. Not really textbook. But there you can see that dew point axis and that pseudo dry line there. Dew points basically drop from the mid-50s into the upper 40s. So it's not a textbook dry line there. Maybe by definition you do have 7 degrees of a dew point drop beyond that with winds out of the west-southwest back behind it. Kind of an arcing dry line here. Bit of an occluded boundary here into northeastern Oklahoma. To get a more textbook uh, cold core setup, you would need more of a bowling ball of an upper level system, more symmetric with its flow around it more vertically stacked from the surface all the way down or from the surface all the way up through the bowling ball. This one's ejecting and advancing. So it, while it's not that cold, symmetric, closed upper level low, it is a bowling ball and it is located directly above the surface low, but it's also ev advancing and ejecting. So that makes that window relatively small for a tornado potential across southeastern Kansas and northeastern Oklahoma. There's some of the EHIs. And even though the EHIs are maxed maxed out further south, I still think you're going to have to play southeastern Kansas, maybe a little closer to the Kansas-Oklahoma border for this one. Your traditional indices, like 0 to 1 kilometer SRH and that, don't really pick up on how favorable this environment is. But there's a lot of holes in this setup, or else I would probably be out there chasing it a lot of times the HRRR model doesn't do as well uh, with these cold core setups and the NAM does a little bit better but I think between about 19 and 21 Z is going to be your window uh, for that tornado potential with this one <laughs> yeah gizmo is upset uh, there's a lot of background noise right now so she is flipping out she wants to either go play or be able to freely come in and out here of uh, my workspace, my shared space here. And when I give the ch uh, talk coming up on ChaserCon, there's going to be all kinds of background noise. Gizmo's going to be upset. There she is. Smells amazing today. Ooh. 
So this is that window. You really want to play the nose of these fields. Let's look at surface vorticity at three kilometer cape overlay. You want to see see that ejecting uh, low level cape there. And the blue lines show you where that vorticity is maximized. And here you can see there's maximal surface vorticity a little bit further west, and it overlays with the nose of that low-level cape wrapping in to that cold bowling ball aloft. This is where the surface vorticity is maximized, right along that arcing boundary. Normally, you'd have a bit longer of an occluded boundary extending beneath a more traditional cold core setup, but in this case, you've got to play the arc of that low-level cape, that low-level instability there, and where it matches up with that strongest low-level vorticity to get land spout tornadoes and low top supercells that have tornado potential, but a pretty good co-location of low level vorticity and low level cape there. And uh, that's at, this is at 19 Z. You can see that overlay is right along the Kansas Oklahoma border. And then lifts up into Southeastern Kansas as we go toward 21 Z about, so 1 PM, it looks like just Southeast of Wichita, maybe K County, Oklahoma, maybe just to the East of there, East of Pawhuska. And then that favorable environment lifts up into southeastern Kansas there, along with that cape and low-level instability. And then it starts to peter out. Now there's a closer to 6 p.m. into southwestern Missouri. Well, that's where we're watching right there, just southeast of the Wichita area, starting at about 19Z and then lifting up into southeastern Kansas. Right along that Kansas-Oklahoma border, though, that's where the best low-level cape and surface vortic vorticity overlay. Oops. So the Oklahoma Mesonet is also an incredible tool for uh, finding out exactly where these features are located right now. Let's look at wind speed and direction here. So here you can see the latest wind from the Oklahoma Mesonet, and you can start to see that dry line starting to surge. It looks like the dry line is located just to the east or very close uh, to I-35. Probably the dry line is actually a bit further west based on dew points. But you can definitely see the instability axis here lifting up into central Oklahoma. And as this thing advances and lifts off to the northeast, you're still in the stable air, though, across north-central Oklahoma and northeastern Oklahoma, but this nose of instability is lifting northward quite rapidly. Looking at the air temperature here, you can see the stable air socked in there to northeastern Oklahoma, but it's advancing rapidly as that dry air in the mid-levels of the atmosphere is overspreading this moisture. Here are the dew points, and that does look like that is the dry line uh, that's advancing off to the east. Look at these dew points, how they drop into the 30s back behind it. You're about to have the dry line surge through Oklahoma City and the I-35 corridor here in Norman. These dew points are about to plummet. But you can definitely see some moisture wrapping into the north of the Oklahoma City area. Uh, that dry air coming in at the mid-levels, the cold air aloft as well, is starting to overspread some of these dew points. But this is the moisture axis. You're going to be talking about dew points into the mid-50s here. And really want to work the nose of that, that moisture axis.
So that's what I'm thinking for this setup. Uh, looks like a decent low top supercell setup happening. It probably will develop near the Oklahoma Kansas border by 19Z by about 1 p.m. or so. And then that arc will lift off to the northeast, and you got to keep bouncing down that line, eventually ending up near the Coffeyville, uh, Bartlesville area. But I do think that the progressiveness of this upper level pattern, the upper level low advancing off to the east, makes that window that much more narrow for a low top supercell threat. You can see this dry air starting to overspread that moisture axis here in northeastern Oklahoma. You can certainly see the spin, too, associated with that Vort Max here, that cold blob of air aloft. And there is still some residual precipitation within that moisture axis. Even though the system is advancing off to the east and there is a lot of instability that is starting to lift up here into north-central Oklahoma, there's going to be a very narrow window for uh, surface-based convection to happen and for a tornado potential to be realized along this Kansas-Oklahoma border. Usually a little bit later in the spring when you get greater peak he surface heating, that's kind of a prime time for cold core setups out here. And this definitely is not a traditional cold core setup, but it is a, a decent low top supercell setup. A great time to see intense, vigorous convection with very crisp updraft bases. But time will tell. So I'm about to speak here in about an hour at ChaserCon, and we're going to share our rocket launch data. And then right after that, if uh, there is a tornado threat, I'm going to go live once again and break these down, these low-top supercells on radar. But very conditional setup, and there's definitely going to require a little bit of mesoscale accident action to get the perfect overlay of that low-level cape and that uh, vorticity without the upper features and surface features ejecting into this stable air too rapidly because it's such a progressive upper-level pattern. So thank you, everybody, for joining my uh, weather report today. Many more on the way. And uh, I look forward to uh, sharing our rocket research uh, for the Chaser Summit uh, coming up here at 2 p.m. So thank you, everybody, and never stop chasing.